So, uh, hello and uh, welcome to our talk, uh, Multi-User Interaction for Large-Scale Virtual Reality Environments. Um, my name is Roland Haring and um, I would like to give you firstly um, some background information, what we understand um, as uh, large-scale VR environments and also what uh, multi-user interaction uh, might mean. Um, afterwards, uh, my colleagues uh, Michael Meyer and uh, Clement Scharfen will um, explain in uh, detail about the uh, Unity project that we have uh, realized for this um, environment. And um, Michael from the perspective of the designer and uh, Clement from the perspective of a uh, developer. Um, firstly, um, this is where we're coming from. We come from Ars Electronica, which is um, uh, um, in, located in Linz in Austria. Um, Ars Electronica is uh, originally an uh, institution which was founded as a media art festival in 1979. And um, out of this um, emerged um, quite diverse um, things, like this building, which is um, actually a museum for uh, media art and related topics about uh, yeah, art, society, technology. And um, also, um, other aspect is uh, a festival, which is um, annual, um, uh, also taking place in Linz. And um, probably, um, um, at least in the world of uh, media art, quite well known is the Brie Ars Electronica, one of the first and um, uh, yeah, highest donated awards for media art. But um, we are coming from the Future Lab, and Future Lab is the R&D department and we are doing experimental and research projects uh, for Ars Electronica, but also for uh, partners from industry and um, economy. So one of the things that we deal with are exper experimental um, visualization technologies, like um, this, what we refer to as Pexels. These are like um, LED-lit quadcopters, which um, form three-dimensional spatial uh, displays um, at night sky, but also like large-scale media installations uh, and stuff like this. Um, a topic that has uh, been of high importance for us uh, since the uh, 90s is virtual reality. And um, currently, we, as you know, I mean, there is quite a hype about uh, virtual reality. And uh, the question is, might be at the moment, like, is there even virtual reality beyond uh, head-mounted displays? And um, actually, this is what we are looking at. So uh, what you see here, for example, is uh, a cave, which was also um, seen in, or in Linz uh, in the 90s, uh, which was one of these really first um, immersive virtual reality environments. Um, which worked like with this back projection cube and the person standing inside of it, um, you had like um, uh, shutter glasses on and um, by uh, flipping left and right um, eye, you could see like really dense stereoscopic environments um, standing inside there and also navigating in it. But for us, like the, the shortcoming of uh, environment like the cave always is that this is basically a single user um, installation. So it works best for the person in the center, the head is tracked, so you know you have a correction of the perspective in real time. But what we really uh, are looking for, um, uh, immersive virtual reality environments where we really can get into with a group of people and uh, really dive into the images that uh, you see. And that's why we came up with this solution, which is uh, the deep space. And this is actually infrastructure that is, uh, can be uh, seen at the Ars Electronica Center. And this is like a L-shaped uh, virtual reality environment for up to 200 people. We have like a floor and a vault projection and people are invited to come in, uh, get into this uh, environment and then also experiment and, and interact with the uh, visualization there. For realizing this, uh, we use in total um, eight 4K projectors. So this is like something that we um, upgraded uh, this year. This was like one of these uh, initial uh, test setups. So each of these projectors can be imagined like a cinema projector. And um, we need in total eight of them, which 
also has been quite uh, challenging for the design of the render engines behind. So we have basically two machines which do the rendering for the environment. Each of these machines is equipped with uh, four M6000 Quattro graphic cards. And the reason is also um, each of the projectors uh, needs like a 4K signal at 120 hertz. This comes like from the reason that it needs to be uh, stereoscopic. And therefore, we need to use uh, all 16 outputs from the machines to just get the image data to the projectors. Because like, I mean, 4K to 120 hertz currently, there is no cable that you can use. So you have to split it up into four cables and for four projectors per each machine. Um, uh, it's quite demanding. But um, this also comes then to the resolution of the, uh, of the whole um, environment, which is up to 8K for a wall and floor. Um, and um, due to overlapping, we're losing some pixels. But in the end, this is then also the resolution that uh, Unity has to work with and also run in stereo, which means like doing really 120 images per second. So quite challenging. But to cut the story short, it's working. And um, other important point for sure is the stereoscopic uh, technology that you um, use for really making spatial images. There are basically two approaches, either passive or active classes. Um, what you see here are the classes that we are using. They are active shutter classes, so there are LAC, LAC, LCD panels inside and uh, the eyes are flipping, so you only see kind of through one eye. And at the same time, you see like the corresponding image in the entire environment. And this is like uh, flipping 120 times per second. And this gives you then really this uh, feeling of uh, immersive three-dimensional um, environment. Um, having this L-shaped um, uh, projection setup, we have several options of how to use it. So like one is really that the focus of the audience is um, uh, then really going to either the floor or the wall uh, surface and to make some kind of a, a split screen situation. Um, but the other thing is really that you use it as one combined surface and to, to really to, to have uh, three dimensional objects which emerged and like in the center of this whole uh, stage. For doing that, what you see here is that the floor looks quite distorted when you look at it from this perspective. But the reason is that uh, the whole camera setup needs to be done for uh, average viewing position of a person that is standing or sitting uh, on the floor. And therefore, you have quite the off-axis projection uh, with uh, the floor projection. But when you stand there, then this looks like really like one image which is uh, correctly distorted. But this is like if you really go in this uh, uh, complete three-dimensional setup, what we're also doing is um, we have a range of uh, really 2D games which are um, shown in this environment. So like really using the surfaces as two-dimensional uh, game planes. And um, people can interact by moving around in the space, like really your physical um, position is locked to uh, a player position that you instantly move. And um, we can do this by kind of a, a laser tracking system that we have implemented in this environment. So these laser rangers that you see there, they are measuring like 270 degrees from the center, like, like little radar stations, um, objects that they're intersecting. And when you put there six, for example, and overlap all the sensor fields, then you get something like the image on the right side. And the black thing is something which is uh, occluded by all of the um, lasers. And then you know there must be some kind of object. And this is something that you can really do um, up to a distance of 35 meters. So this is working for our deep space environment. This deep space is uh, 16 by 9 meters approximately. So this is like um, the size. But um, this is just one example of um, uh, interaction that we are thinking of in this um, environment. And uh, we will also hear of, of different forms of interactions from my colleagues when they um, explain uh, the Unity project that we did for this environment this year, which is called the Human Body, a Universe Within. Thank you. So. Yeah, the human body universe within. Uh, in German, it's called Universum Mensch, with this, which is strangely a lot shorter. Um, yeah, what we wanted to do with this is uh, 
like uh, explore the human body. We wanted to show it in a few new views and perspectives, and uh, also we want to impart the medical knowledge that we uh, that there is. And because we have also a lot of experts that we're working with, like surgeons and doctors that come to us and want to show some of the materials, want to educate the people, um, and. Yeah, they come to us even with uh, their own movies, their own 3D models, whatever, and they they want to put it in the deep space. And uh, yeah, so this project also had to handle a lot of different kinds of data, like uh, images, videos, models, whatever. Um, yeah, and we also wanted it to be more than just like a PowerPoint presentation, but also an interactive experience. Um, yeah, a few of the design goals we had, um, the, the form that this works uh, in, our, in the deep space is that it's always a directed presentation, so there's a presenter in the front uh, telling the people what's going on, more or less, uh, <clears throat> so the people are never just going in there and exploring the space for themselves. Um, yeah, and one kind of presenters is the info trainers, like we call them. This is our army of guides that uh, show the people around in the museum. Um, and the other, as I said, is the specialists that come to us. Um, yeah. And what else is there to say about this? Uh, so what it, what it was not going to be, the whole thing, is that it's, uh, we didn't want or we couldn't build a whole uh, atlas of the anatomy of the human body or a, a whole reference because uh, that would, like, explode the, the amount of data and the amount of cost that we, we had for this project. And so we had to do it like story driven, that uh, we pick out the most interesting parts of the body and the most interesting parts that you could put into a story and put them uh, into sort of uh, stories that we tell to the audience. Um, this is uh, sort of the, the backbone of our application. This is a very detailed, very high quality 3D model of the of the body, we got this in a male and female version, and uh, yeah, it has a lot of layers. It has like all the bones, all the all the uh, circulatory system, all the muscles, all the whatever, uh, almost everything, more or less. And uh, this is a very early version of. Uh, I just threw that in Unity and played around with the standard shader a bit, and it already looked quite good. I think so. This was also helping us in the decision to, to go with Unity with this. Um, this is also one of the very early concepts where we thought about just taking a, one camera and shrinking it to a, I mean, there is, I think there is a few movies that, that build on that theme, like shrinking people into a submarine into, and go into the human body and explore it like this. Um, so, at first, we thought we, we would do it like this, but the problem is that uh, uh, all the data, all the different data sources that we have come in different scales and different sizes and have different uh, levels of detail. And transitioning between those would mean a lot of work. So because like we have this uh, 3D model of the body and we go into a, a blood vessel, and but the blood vessel is just a few polygons then, and then we would have to model this special part of the of the body in more detail, for example. And then again, it would mean that we always have to do the transition on this place, and we can't go in any other blood vessel and do it the same way, because the model is like placed there and, and, and so on. Um, and so the story would become very linear, and, and that's what we didn't want to do. And so also another point was that some materials we would get, we would just wouldn't get in a higher resolution. For example, if you get a video that is just in HD, it doesn't make sense to show it full screen in an 8K environment, for example. So we didn't do it like that. And we came to another idea that uh, we would do a sort of uh, a vision of how maybe a future diagnostics room could look like. So um, that you have, you, you have your uh, we had a few uh, inspirations from movies and stuff. Uh, yeah, like uh, the, the body is somewhere in, inside a scanner and then the doctor sees a huge 3D model and can pick, can, uh, pick out details and, and look at them and move them around. And 
<coughs> so this is what our uh, screen more or less looks like. So we have in the center, we have the, the whole model, and then we can pick out uh, 3D models as details. We can also, we have a lot of, just we have all those windows where we, uh, yeah, where we put in movies and, and, and whatever, and on the top right you can see uh, a sort of just life data from the, from the human body. That, uh, so, it looks like, so it looks like always like a consistent, uh, a consistent display of one patient, for example. Um, yeah, the whole UI is like a huge, larger than life uh, interface that you, you stand. It's, it's a bit hard to see in the image because it's of course 2D, but you really, if you stand in the room, you really get that feeling that there is a, in the back there is a, the, the space opens up even more because there is a sort of a, environment in the background that's very far away from the 3D perspective. And then you have all those screens and displays in front of you that sort of uh, shape like a, a quarter dome above you. And uh, what we also did that we gave just really everything, we gave a little depth, so uh, this is more or less how the thing looks in Unity from the side. And yeah, so everything has depth. So in the window, if there is a 3D model, it always comes out a bit. And even the interface elements are like uh, not all in one plane, but uh, come back and forth a bit. So yeah. And the, another aspect is that we use the floor projection as an as its own uh, its own display, where we. Now in this situation, mostly we just display the huge 3D model, like a 50 meters wide uh, 3D model of the human body that you can walk around on and, and, and look on. And this also adds a very simple, very simple interface for, all, for the audience, uh, which is totally analog because you can just, uh, you don't need to move around the model because if you want to see something in detail, you just walk there. And if you want to see it in even closer detail, you just bend down and look at it closer. And with the uh, 8K resolution that we have in the, in the space, uh, it also really works. So you never get the feeling that uh, the resolution is not enough. Um, other interfaces that we have is uh, for the presenter, we tried out a few things like the Leap Motion, the Mayo, and more or less for a fallback, also an app on a mobile device. So. Uh, um, with the leap motion and the Mai, you can just use gestures to move the story forward or, or to uh, enter a certain detail of the story, like uh, if you want to show the heart and you go into the window of the heart and then you wave around and you can turn it and, and things like that. And uh, yeah, we tried to keep it really simple. So we wanted to not uh, hold up the presenters with uh, the interface, so it should really be a very, a very subtle, a very subtle thing that they that they do, and they can concentrate on the on the presentation. But uh, we also wanted to give uh, the pres uh, to show what the presenter is doing to the audience, so to give also the audience the feeling that they are actually in a in an interactive environment, and it's not just uh, a movie that's that's running in, in the in the back. And for example, we also displayed the hands of the leap motion uh, in the, on, the, on the big screen. So you have like these giant hands. You can see it in a, in a later movie some, at some point uh, in the presentation, um, where, it, uh, where you actually also can use the hands to point somewhere on the screen and yeah. Um, and we added a few interactive elements for the audience as well. So there is this uh, sensi sensor cubes, that, like how we call them. Uh, it's like uh, where you can put in your own bio data, more or less like a, a pulse, uh, pulse monitor that you, that you take and, and then you see the heart beating in your frequency. Uh, giant heart, like three meters wide or whatever. And yeah, we, and there is also concepts about using the laser tracking for it, like that you have to uh, act as uh, antibodies and uh, step out uh, like uh, viruses or whatever to uh, save the save the patient from uh, from an illness. Um, yeah, this is just another view of a few 
uh, things that we that we got. The top left one is uh, from Fraunhofer Mavis. It's a CT scan of a beating heart. So it's an animated CT scan, and it's in 3D. And that's and in the bottom right, this uh, a thing that Siemens is working on. I think. Uh, it's a volumetric renderer that actually already works in real time. And we also try to get this into, the, into our application. The problem is, of course, that it's not working in Unity. So we kind of have to step out of our application and put this one in, into the foreground and then go back. That's a thing we're still working on. And the solution we have, uh, Clemens, I think, will tell you about it. Um, yeah, that's so far my part. Clemens will tell you a bit of the technical aspects of the whole thing. Yeah, thank you. So from a developer's perspective, um, we had some needs for this application. So one of the needs was to keep the content updated. Well, um, of course, we are the future lab, so the content should be state of the art or future art or future things. And to reach this, um, we had a modular design. So. Um, we build things up in our stories, in our micro stories. These are some kinds of topic like an introduction to the body or medical imaging for CTs or something like this. Um, sub parts of this are our sections. So these are basically scenes with some game objects. And then there are the frames. You can see them in the scene to present them. So I'm pretty sure. Um, that you know the problem. I mean, this project is already running in the deep space, so it's already shipped. And if you have sh ever shipped a, a program, you know that there's hardly any time for updates. So this is quite a problem. So what we did for that is uh, to, to make it pretty fast to update our content. So we needed a quick workflow. And what you can see in the background is some editor works. We are creating here a new frame, which is just a little bit of clicking around, adding content, um, putting it all together, and starting it. And actually, that's it. So putting up a new frame takes two minutes or so. That's the time you can do whenever you want. And well, that was the solution for us to, to keep the content updated. Yeah, that's the result. That's everything you have to do to put in a new frame. Um, same with, with uh, new sections or new scenes. Just put up new scenes, put in a new frames. And also with new micro stories, the so whole topics you can add with them. Um, for that, you need a little bit scripting, but also just on a basic level. It's pretty fast. Um, to navigate through our application, um, Michael already talked about it. We have this uh, mobile application. This is basically only for the highlight guides. And um, the design goals for this application was um, that it's functional, usability friendly, flexible, and stable. <laughs> stable because um, a highlight guide in our deep space doesn't have keys or, or a mouse to navigate through the application or to use it in the deep space. Basically, it's only a mobile phone to navigate through it, so it really needs to be stable. And it needs to be flexible. Um, we have generic views to navigate through our application. So basically, what you see on the mobile phone is just what you need in the moment. Just to give you um, some kind of feeling what this is like. Um, on the top view, you can see these arrows, left or right. So they are enabled when there are more than one frames in the scene. You can navigate through the, um, through the frames. There's some story-based tellings. This is the next button, where you can just go to the next part of the story, on and on. Or there's also a menu where you can switch between the scenes or the sections. And um, what I meant by generic views is that the views depending on the frames. So if I um, want to control the, the story, I have this next button. If I want to control body parts, there's, for example, this list. There's also a touch panel, for example, for the flow. I can, for the floor, I can um, 
scroll into the whole body model on the 60 times 9 meter scale. Yeah, and that's, that's basically the application. There's some other views too, but just to give you an impression. Uh, a public interface, also Michael told you about this, are the sense cubes. These have been developed by my colleague, Marianne Tanek. She's standing behind there. She, you can also see her in the videos. Um, they are printed by a 3D printer. And basically, it's just a bunch of, of sensors. In this case, you can see um, the lung capacity monitor. So if you breathe in or breathe out, more or less, um, you will see that your uh, lung folds together during your exhalation. And for, for the heart, we have a pulse oximeter. This is working with, with infrared light. So the reflection from this light is, is detected by a photo detector. And there you can get your heartbeat rate, the BPM, just bringing the heart to beat. Or also um, we have this uh, health line um, where you can see it. We already have a third cube, which is an accelerometer. Um, pretty sure you know the concept. Um, we will use this in a new micro story about uh, sensors. So in this case, the sense of balance. Another interface is the Mayo. So it's not only that we wanted to have this um, deep space as a future technology or um, cutting edge technology with this uh, huge stereo projection, 8K. But we also wanted to have a future interface, and that's where Mayo comes in, into the play. For those who do not know Mayo, it's an armband which is um, measuring your muscle data, and you can do poses like wave in, wave out, um, do a fist or whatever, and that we can use these things to navigate through the application. Another one is the leap motion. I'm pretty sure everyone knows the, the leap motion. You can see it in the exhibition hall. And that's uh, basically the same, so we can navigate also through the application. We want to have some kind of minority report feeling, um, swiping away, but of course this is not yet uh, possible with, within <laughs> the time we had to develop this project. Um, right, these are the, the interfaces. Basically, um, what we are, what our next steps are that we are going open source. We will publish a little framework for uh, things like um, how to, to manage the camera setup in the deep space or um, some other things you basically need for every project when you do something in this, um, in this virtu uh, virtual environment. <coughs> And now it's up to you. So if you uh, question <laughs> if you want to do something big, so really big, I mean 16 times 9 meters, 8K big, um, you may give us a call or catch up with us. We are around here on the ne next day too. Or visit our homepage. It's aec.at. We'd like to hear from your ideas. Maybe you want to try something out in the deep space in Austria. So. Thank you for your attention. There's only one minute left, so if there's a question. Well, fantastic talk, guys. Um, I was standing in every way. I have uh, oh, so many questions, but uh, first off, if, if I do have like a 16 by nine, uh, Spot is that like the the minimum? What is the minimum uh, cost? Like the ballpark, I guess. Um, and also, I'm very interested in like the laser positioning and how you position bodies because I've, I've seen that a lot. I think it's it's very magical. Yeah, I mean, uh, approximately, if you build it from scratch, it's around one million euros or something. Uh -huh. So this was like the um, investment probably from from the Arts Electronica Center to build an environment like this. So it is quite unique. But um, yeah, you can build it in different scales. So, um, but most of the expensive part are the projectors for sure. And uh, yeah, the, the laser tracking itself is something that we're researching on for like 
three years now and uh, because it's like we, we did experiments with Kinect cameras like multi-Kinect setups but uh, just um, due to the space of the environment it's really hard uh, to, to track people with the Kinect because like it's eight to ten meters maximum and then it's getting so noisy and um, so we, we had did a lot of experimenting also with infrared cameras and stuff like this but the, the laser tracking was most practical also because we're doing a lot of student projects there with um, universities that um, uh, making lectures in this environment and um, the, the laser tracking is quite simple because you get just a 2D position for each user and you can also, I mean it's, it's precise enough that you can you get not only a blob for the user but also like uh, information for each feed of the user so actually each user consists of two small blobs which allows you then also to make some tap gestures, like if you raise your leg and put it down and then you can transform the, the floor if you want to in some kind of a, a multi-touch uh, surface. And this allows then again um, also um, yeah, new game concepts or game mechanics. And this is then also very interesting for the students and it's quite simple to, to implement against it. Um, yeah. So the, the other thing is the shadows. So like I, I noticed some of the use the in the cave use the re rear projection. The rest of it is front projection, right? But do you use multiple projectors to? Yeah. Is yeah. No shadows. Yeah. That, that's why we have um, four projectors for the floor. If, if you would only have one projector, then you get quite uh, big shadows. The projectors are um, quite off axis. Um, the way they are hanging, so that means that when you stand in the center, the more or less the shadow is always behind you. So um, this works quite good. So um, this is nearly no problem. Yes, well, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. One more? Yeah. So I know there are commercial uh, middleware solutions like to do Unity and things like Caves, but you're not using any um, thing like that. You're using your own framework to handle the multi-machine rendering and the tracking and all that. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We, we are looking for a middleware solution which would uh, ease the living for us. Okay. But um, there's nothing that we found so far that works out of the box. So, I mean, one, one thing which is also quite challenging, so also Clemens will go to the expert corner today, is uh, the network synchronization if you have really two uh, instances of Unity running and they are really like uh, one projection intersecting more or less with the other. You need to be really very fast when you do an uh, update of the sync graph because like, if, you are like, if you have a latency of one or two frames, then this is something that gets visible. And therefore, you really need to, to if you do this with UNET, for example, or Unity networking, uh, you need, really need to try to get most out of it. And sometimes we have big problems with it. So uh, still, so, but this is something that where we get hopefully some insights. We'll have but solved after this for other projects, so are, you are need to implement this also from scratch. Are you using like the multiplayer system for state synchronization between the computers or is that? What, um, In, yeah, at, at the moment. Basically, it, we're yeah. just trying it around with networking, just um, okay. trying it around with our own UDP things or also with UNET, of course. Okay. But the architecture is mostly that um, one instance is the master and the other one is the slave, which just gets synchronized and does not make any simulations. So only one uh, instance is simulating and then distributing the sync graph changes to the other machine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.